¿Qué onda, players? Welcome back to the channel. I'm the Mexican PA. Today we actually have a special guest on the channel, and I'm super excited to introduce you guys to him. He's a PA in North Carolina. His name is Carlos. He's a physician associate, software developer, and co-founder of a website that we're going to be showcasing today called prepabuddy.com. This is a free online tool dedicated to making the PA school application process easier and accessible for all. And Carlos is, a, is passionate about the intersection of healthcare and technology. And he's a first generation Latino and firmly believes in helping break down barriers into STEM careers like the PA field. Carlos graduated with a BA in political science from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and also has his master's of physician assistant studies from Campbell University. And so without further ado, here is Carlos. Good. Uh, thanks for having me on the on the show. I'm super excited to to get through these questions and share a little bit more about myself and the project. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Just so our, our viewers know, you're currently in in Mexico right now, right? So we're you're, we're shooting this, and you're out in Mexico. Absolutely. I've been here for the past five weeks, and I still have like another week or so left here. But it's been absolutely okay. incredible uh, being, being down here. That's awesome. That's awesome, man. And I'm assuming you have you know family from either your moms or dads out there. Yeah, uncles, cousins, yeah, plenty of family down here. Oh, so good. I, I, I need to go. I need to go back. <laughs> okay, so before we dive into kind of your story and your journey as a PA, I want to make sure that we first start off with presenting PPA Buddy um, and asking you some questions about this online platform and tool. And so I'm just going to dive straight into the questions. Number one, what is prepabuddy.com and why should prepas use it? Yeah, so prepabuddy.com is a free tool that is geared to uh, helping pre-PA students uh, with all of the application process that kind of leads up going to, uh, to applying to PA school. So keeping track of all your courses, your schools, uh, exploring what some school requirements are, looking at their mission statements. Uh, it's kind of like a hub that uh, it aims to kind of have everything centralized. So when it comes time for you to apply, uh, it can be a pretty seamless experience because uh, if you've heard, Casper can be kind of, you know, tedious to input everything manually. So it really is a tool from the beginning to the end of that process of getting you into PA school. So question number two, what inspired you and your co-founder, Gerardo, to design this website? So as most projects do in, in the software development world, this kind of just started off as a small weekend project where I thought it'd be kind of cool if I could create a uh, just an easy tool that someone can, you know, pre-PA so they could log on to and just and put their stats, course, you know, their courses, GPA, and get some feedback as to what schools they could apply to or, or be close to eligible to being, you know, being able to apply to. And the response was really good. People started asking for different features, different things, and it kind of grew from there. In this space, I, I, I did, I mean, there are some tools that you can pay for. And to me, it just didn't really seem fair to kind of add on an additional financial burden to some of these students that are already struggling to pay, you know, their courses, I know we have the PA cat also being accepted by some schools. Yeah. So for me, it was really important for it, you know, to provide something free that uh, could help these students and uh, you know, not set them back uh, because some of their peers are using other, other paid resources. Yeah. And thank you for doing that. Cause it, it, it is super expensive. And I don't think when you're first starting off as a pre-PA, right, you don't realize just um, how taxing and expensive this process is both like emotionally and also financially. Like every, you know, turn and corner of the process, there's, you know, a, a fee here and a fee there, 50 bucks here, a hundred bucks there. And so thank you. For, it adds for up. It adds up. It free. And it does add up. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so from what I recall, I mean, I followed you some time on Instagram. You guys, like you said, you built the code for this site from the ground up. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. Everything's built yeah. from scratch. I mean, we do leverage some libraries, but everything is, is pretty custom built. And so how long did it take to, to build this? And what were some of the challenges you guys ran into? Yeah, so the first iteration of this, which was just a basic, you know, enter your GPA in courses tool, that took me just over the weekend to get that up. But to what, what we're seeing now where you can create an account and it keeps track of all these little things, you know, related to your coursework and, and, and history, yeah. that took, I'd say, probably three, three and a half months to really get off the ground. Uh, and just because there's a lot of uh, foundation work that also goes into it because like I was mentioning earlier, uh, I want to build also, or we're in the process of building a Chrome extension that will take all those course history that you already put in and seamlessly tr uh, transfer that into Caspa, so you don't have to do that process twice. So that it's is it, it's so amazing. 
Yeah, because that's one of the, the things that is literally a headache to do. I'm having to print out your transcript yeah. and then put every grade, every course number. It definitely took me a couple days. It's so tedious that CASPA itself has exactly. this, a, like an extension or something where you can pay like 50 or 60 bucks so that they do it. I, I, last time I checked, I think it's it's $75 per transcript. So, that is it's, so it you, definitely like, adds up for schools. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Kind of along the lines of that feature. What are some of the features or feature that you're most proud of? I assume it's that one, but any, any others? Honestly, just, I think the, the fact that we're able to bring this collective set of features to users for basically, you know, for free, for no cost. That's really what, what makes me proud. I think there's still some areas that I'd like to see the site improve where, you know, the design, the usability, add in more features. But as far as like the, the big picture, that core functionality, uh, I think it's great. It's, it's working, it's there. And I'm, I'm pretty proud uh, to hear, you know, some feedback that I get from you just saying how helpful it's been. And, and yeah, I, I hope we can continue to get the word out because uh, like I said, it's, it's a free resource. Definitely. And um, I mean, I've recommended it to all the, the kind of the pre-PAs that I, that I mentor it. Cause I mean, again, it's a, it's a really helpful tool because the alternative is to not keep track of your hours. And then when you do have to do it, you pull up your Excel document and you try to like look at your pay stubs and see how many hours you worked <laughs> as in my case as an EMT and how many hours you worked in the ED. And it's just a headache. It's easier to just do it, exactly. you know, as you're going through the motion. Exactly. Well, guys, that's pretty much the the questions that I have for pre-PA Buddy. And now we're going to dive into essentially hearing about Carlos's journey in becoming a PA. And so we'll start with this question. What specialty are you currently practicing in? I currently practice in internal medicine. Okay. And how many uh, years into practice are you? I'm going into my third year as, pra as a practicing PA. Definitely has been quite a ride. Yeah, I, I imagine. I can only imagine. I've heard of, you know, other, other new grad experiences and it's definitely a uh, learning curve. Where did you uh, go to undergrad? For undergrad, I went to uh, the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Uh, and it's probably the best four years of my life because it's where I met a lot of my friends, connected deeper with my culture. And I feel like those years really kind of shaped me into to who I am today. And uh, how many times did you apply to PA school? I was very lucky to uh, only apply once. And uh, I even applied late. I think I applied like early August. And so that's pretty late into the into the cycle, especially when everyone. Yeah, like, it is. On the first two weeks, they're like, it had they have everything you know ready. But I think it's also kind of speaks to my background as just being a first generation immigrant and not really knowing what I needed to know. So I kind of prepared late in that year. It was kind of more like I I feel like I should apply for the heck of it, but obviously not throw money down the drain. So I applied to three schools and and fortunately was able to land an interview, and the rest is history. That's awesome. That's awesome. It's it's really a huge, I'm sure you experienced too, the relief of getting in and not having to go through the beast that is. Oh, absolutely. And from what I hear, it gets even more and more competitive every year. So I, you know, I probably wouldn't have the same look uh, if I were applying this cycle. It's just the nature of the game, it seems like. The next question, what did you do for your pre-PA healthcare um, hours? Experience. Like your your yeah. healthcare experience, yeah. I worked, uh, I volunteered quite a bit, but I also worked as a, as a medical assistant at a primary care clinic that is owned by two Latino PAs. And so awesome. they see a lot of, you know, uninsured Latino uh, patients. So it was a great fit because I, I got to see, I mean, they basically became mentors, you know, I got to see what. Uh, it was like for them to practice as a PA, but also what it was like to to run a clinic, which is no easy feat. And so they're they're owners of of that clinic. I'm assuming they're, they're both co-owners of the, of the clinic. Yep. Um, and then just for our viewers, when you got your, you know, that MA position, was that with you know outside uh, training or like a certification? Good good question. No. So again, speaking to kind of how like I was so in the dark of the process, I earned a CNA certification. Got it. Thinking, you know, that was like a, a good segue to, to go to the medical assistant route. And it technically was because it taught, taught me, you know, a lot of valuable skills. But yeah. there's also people out there, uh, providers that are willing to, to train you, uh, you know, because they want to help out. And that was the case with this, uh, with this clinic. I started volunteering there just at first, one or two days out of the week. And then it just happened so that it, a position opened up and they were like, hey, we'll, we'll continue training you on the spot and, you know, and pay you for it, of course. 
And uh, so, yeah, I'm, technically, I, I didn't need it. I'm glad that you said that. And a few weeks ago, I actually uh, made a video talking about different ways to get your healthcare experience, and I'll attach a link to that video somewhere in this uh, window. But definitely, that is a common thing, especially for MA positions. I just have one of my mentees who uh, he went and shadowed a PA for like a week, and they got a job offer without any, you know, without needing a certification and stuff like that. Where I see the MA cert come into play is like big uh, institutions hospital yeah. systems so like all of the ma's at the oncology clinic that i was recently at all of them had like official mm. certs and stuff like that now let's talk about pa school what was your favorite part about pa school i, I just re remember back to the to having that excitement of like oh my gosh i'm gonna you know earn a white code earn the opportunity to see a patient someone's life is going to be in my hands so it was kind of like that aspiration of like one day I'll be you know managing my own patient load that all kind of was my my motivational drive throughout PA school those long nights of studying it was uh it kind of helped clarify or at least make it distinct that you know you're not just studying for a test but you really need to know this stuff because it's not something that you can just kind of breeze your, your way through uh people's yeah. lives are on your hands so I'd say that yeah. it was just knowing that uh the responsibility you know was uh was going to be uh, a great one and so kind of along on the contrast of this what was your least favorite part about pa school definitely the amount of studying you know it just felt like it was never enough uh i just remember studying for its test and just thinking like there's just no <laughs> there's no way that i that i that i can learn all of this in time for this test but uh yeah. i think you know i think with times you, you kind of get used to figuring out at least how to study more efficiently yeah and and you kind of just learn to live with that feeling like i'm not sure. gonna know everything like i can't say i'm telling myself that like okay like i've done the high yield and I, obviously there's always going to be curveballs but you know i may be prepared for some of them and others i won't be and I, th yeah. I think that also translates well into into the clinical experience because there's there's be cases plenty of cases where you you're kind of stumped and yeah. uh i i think most patients will appreciate you you know, coming forth like, hey, I, I'm I'm kind of stumped on this, but I'm I'm gonna, you know, we're gonna figure this out together. I'm gonna point you to the right direction, uh, because yeah, it's it's impossible to know anything. I mean, to know everything. And what made you go into your current uh, specialty? When I was interviewing, I and you really, it came down to like either emergency medicine or or some kind of like primary care for me because being bilingual, being a first generation immigrant, I knew I could serve as a cultural bridge to kind of help close some of those gaps that you know were aware that exist in medicine. So I wanted to to choose a place that not only uh, where I could use my Spanish and cultural background skills, but also that it had a uh, pretty significant marginalized community uh, you know, as, as patients. And yeah. so when I was interviewing, that was very important to me. I remember I. I ended up also interviewing like at a hematology uh, clinic, but it was just very removed from the world that I kind of wanted to be in. So uh, that kind of, it was basically that, that's what led me down that path. And I found a great opportunity at a clinic, you know, with that kind of population and it was a no brainer. That's awesome. Yeah. That was going to be kind of my next uh, question. If you were, you know, like in the hospital setting or like in a, in a clinic. So how long was your training at your current job? So they, um, I, I moved on to my second job since graduating, but my first okay. job, like out of school, they, they do a pretty good job of kind of providing this orientation, um, slowly letting you, you know, practice more independently throughout, you know, the first six months. Um, but I think really all, all I needed was about maybe like a month of, of, uh, of orientation and training. And then after that, you kind of just started getting your own groove, you know, and it's important to find yeah. that that groups. And then once you get in it, that's where I think a lot of the real learning happens. So I think that kind of varies from person to person, but, uh, but definitely make sure as a new grad, you're finding somewhere that supports you um, and, and understands what it's like to, to transition a new grad into, you know, a full-time practicing PA. Good advice. How long have you been at this uh, current clinic, the internal med one? Going on about a month and a half. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, this question is kind of a, a interesting what is the most unique part about your 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 specialty definitely the fact that um i've moved on to to a clinic now that is even more hyper focused on being like the premier go-to clinic for latinos so that's awesome you, you know they they're on the radio they're out in the community they want to maybe 
when, when you know, a Latino thinks about healthcare, they, they want to be at the forefront of that. So it's been, uh, I think for, for me, it's been a unique experience because not only am I getting to see more of those patients, but I'm also yeah. able to, I built some software tools for them to kind of help make the day to day a little bit more seamless for the staff. So I get to kind of combine the two things that I love. And that's awesome that you're able to, to bridge that, that, you know, you use your PA skills and your, your software development skills. That's awesome. Yeah. So now this is kind of for the pre PA or pre med or a student who's just kind of considering in what healthcare field uh, to go into and uh, why should someone not become a PA? It's a great question. I think if you're not in it for the right reasons and that can kind of, you know, maybe there's some, some gray area there, but for me, the right reasons is to truly make an impact in people's lives. Then I, yeah. I think, you know, burnout in medicine is a real thing. So yes. uh, I, I think that's a huge striver is you, you have to actually care deeply care about the people that you're trying to help. And, and that has to give you some kind of satisfaction. Uh, otherwise, you know, if you're in it for the money or any kind of status, it, it's, you know, you, you may not be, you may not enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah. Cause having that kind of intrinsic, like altruistic kind of drive, it makes it okay to kind of sometimes I hate to say it, you know, put up with, with the headaches of, you know, dealing with, you know, healthcare administration or ins insurances or, you know, whatever it may be, uh, like our system, our healthcare system, especially in the United States is not perfect. Uh, yeah. but having that driver helps, you know, helps 100%. bear through, through those things. 100%. Yeah. Going back to, to your job, I know you've been out of school for three years. Are you ever nervous coming in to work at all? Not coming in. But there, sometimes I will see like a patient case chief complaint pop up and I'm like, oh, that, you know, that's strange or that, that looks bad. And that makes me, you know, that makes me a little bit nervous. Uh, more so just again, because I, I deeply care. I, I always want to make sure that any patient that I see, I'm actually helping. Uh, yeah. And of course, you never want to do anything, anything detrimental. So that's, that's the, the pressure that's uh and I guess more internal is just making sure that I am doing the right thing uh, for the patient. And it's a good one to have because you don't want to lose that. Once you you start thinking that you're, you know, super knowledgeable and confident and you don't need to look anything up, that's when we start getting exactly. into, into issues. <laughs> and so how many uh, patients do you see on average? And this could be at your old job or your current job. And how many do you yeah. see on average? And what is the most that you've ever seen? So the most I've seen is probably 29 patients in a 12 hour shift. Okay. Um, average was probably somewhere between 20 to 25 in that 12 hour shift. And now at the new job, I'm seeing somewhere between 10 to 16. Now the next question, what has been the most challenging part? What was the most challenging part of transitioning from being a PA student to a practicing PA? And I'm super interested in your answer for this because I'm like yeah. six months away. And I'm, my palms just trying to get sweaty, just, you know, thinking about. It matter, yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it definitely has to be like, I feel like everything just kind of culminates and hits you like a brick wall whenever you're yeah. seeing that first patient and, you know, assuming it's something easy, like, uh, whatever, X, Y, Z, but something a little bit more complex and you're like, okay, this is something complex. And the, the assessment and plan is fully on me. So formulating that, working through that, making sure you're not forgetting anything. Because uh, it's one thing to kind of read about it and then go sit down and be like, okay, this is what I would do, you know, in a soap note. But when you're actually talking through things with that patient, that patient asks questions. Uh, I, for me, that, that, that was the hardest thing because uh, you kind of have to find a groove, like I was saying, to, to, uh, to keep that dialogue feeling natural and uh, not get too caught up in your head like, oh, I'm a little you know, scared here because everything's on me, but that transition for me was probably the hardest. But I think for me, you know, probably for most people, once you get over that and you find that groove, you're in the, you're in the good zone. Smooth sailing in the good yeah. zone. Yeah, I love it. All right. I hope it's, it's not too uh, brutal for me to get into that good zone. Um, You'll be fine. So, so what was something that you didn't expect um, once you were in practice as a PA or any like shockers? That's a great question. So of course, this is going to vary for everyone. For me, it definitely has to be the amount of admin burden that you end up taking on as your patient case loads, you know, increases. Um, yeah. It's it's not it's not just like okay, you're seeing the patient, and once you're done, like you're done. 
you know, especially if you're managing 20, 25 people a day, uh, whether it's prescription refills, papers that need to get filled out, uh, they're, or they're calling because they're not, you know, feeling better, just a ton of things that you're coming back to the next day that it's not, it's not like you're starting fresh with the schedule, but you're also, you know, dealing with everything that happened during the week. Plus, you're, you know, sometimes you could also be you know, covering for another provider, which just kind of adds in a little bit more of that workload. So it's definitely a lot of admin stuff that, uh, you know, you may not necessarily have a clear picture about going into PA school because you don't really, you know, you don't really get trained on that. But, uh, but yeah, to me, that was, that was a big shocker. Especially like a family medicine or internal med clinic. Like it's not just the patients that are coming in kind of like in emergency medicine. They come in and then you'll probably never see them again. And you're essentially managing, you know, hundreds, you know, over a thousand uh, patients. And so, and that includes refills, that includes like checkups, that includes like, you know, everything in between that, mm-hmm. that uh, anything that they need essentially, because you're a primary care provider, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's definitely, you know, one, one of the challenges that you kind of have to, uh, that also has a learning curve because you have to learn how to do, manage all that efficiently. Uh, yeah. And the day-to-day is always going to be something, you know, a little bit different. Sometimes you'll have, you know, in, in a primary care, a patient that requires, you know, two to three time slots and you kind of have to be very savvy about how you manage that. And so still talking about your work, how many hours do you work on average per week? Right now I'm down to 30 hours, I believe. Uh, nice. Yeah, it's about 30 hours. And uh, I currently work basically two jobs. I, I PA and and uh, I'm a software developer too for for a company. Oh, awesome. And so for regarding the, the, the PA, what time do you normally go into work and when do you leave? This new job is is a typical 8 to 4.30, 8 to 5. Do you take call? Yeah, we rotate call with one uh, amongst the providers. You know, if there's, let's say, five, six providers on staff, then you know, we rotate uh, once a week with them. Okay. And for internal meds specifically, because th- this is something I'm just curious about, um, is that like for patients that have like questions at any point in time, or is it you have to go in into the, the clinic? No, no, you definitely don't have to go in. It's just more so the, I guess you could call it after hours care. If there's anything mm-hmm, emergent okay. where they're trying to discern like, hey, can this, can this wait until the morning? Or should I, you know, go seek some emergent or urgent care? Uh, it's more of that kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good to know. Cause I know sometimes we hear call and it's like, you think a surgeon who was like waking right. up in the morning and like has to drive to the hospital. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. And don't so know. <laughs> what has been the most rewarding experience you've had on your journey thus far? Mm-hmm. And this could be anything, your PPA, your PA, your PA student journey, or even, you know, now as a PA. I, I definitely have to tie it in, tie it into the cultural background that I grew up with and that I have. So uh, you know, and in the Latino culture, uh, there's a lot of, uh, I guess, your elders, whether that's grandparents, parents, aunts, or whatever, that um, they tell you like mijo, you know, gracias mijo, o Dios te bendiga, those kind of things yeah. to me, it, it just really hits so close to home. So uh, lately, I've had a lot of patients who, you know, either want to give me a hug or just say gracias mijo, que Dios te bendiga, and that satisfaction that I get from that is it's just there's no words because I feel like I'm in the right place doing what I I should be doing to help my community and that that is amazing yeah I got a taste of that uh <laughs> serving with a uh, clinic at the Pati, which serves kind of the the Latino population out here in Sacramento um, and it's it's so sweet and just a a huge kind of like fuel to the fire that is you know becoming a a provider mm-hmm. so that, that's awesome. That's awesome to hear. All right. A kind of lighter question. What is your favorite nerdy medical fact? Oh, man. Favorite nerdy medical fact. I'd say not necessarily a fact, but uh, I have some family that are, are also in medicine here in Mexico. Oh, okay. And just and I've gotten to see firsthand kind of how the treatment plans are kind of, uh, you know, a bit different. So I say overall, it's... I, you know, we, we, of course, are taught in the American, you know, uh, medical school kind of system. But uh, it, I think it's there's some benefit to traveling abroad and seeing how other countries practice medicine, because, yeah. you know, you may find some things are quite, uh, quite interesting in what they do. There's medications, for example, here in Mexico, um, you know, a family member will, will ask me like, hey, I, I was prescribed this. Like, what do you think? And there's some medications that I've never even heard of. And I'm like, oh, no, I know I have to look this one up. I've, I've never heard of it. So I, I think that it's just uh, how we all practice medicine, but 
it's uh it's not necessarily just a one way kind of you know street definitely definitely yeah i just think back to like for instance my dad he's always in telling him i'm in, injecting uh the three velose which is like a vitamin it, exactly yeah. <laughs> b12 and folic acid he's like He's like, salí cansado del trabajo. I'm super tired. Like, miñetas, miñetas. And before, I was like, a EMT. I'm like, no, I'm not going to inject you. Like, I don't even know what that is. But now I'm just yeah. like, you know, I'm All like, right. I guess. I'm like, I, I don't think you are deficient in vitamin right. B12. Like, what I think is you need rest. You need to drink water. But Exactly. Yeah. But some people swear by it. And, you know, some people swear by it. So it's just, yeah. it's it's interesting. The, the yeah, or the, the fumadas. Like, yeah, ponte mamisan. Esa, te va, te va a curar. Exacto. Vas a ser como, como nuevo mañana. Exacto. Yeah. <laughs> um, so now some other questions outside of you know your your PA career. What is your favorite thing to do when you're not working? It's definitely spend time with my family. I'm I'm big, big, big into family. So um, whether that's just you know catching up with my brothers or hanging out with my entire family or just even FaceTiming them, uh, that's usually where you can find me if I'm not uh, working or you know doing a quick workout. It's usually my family. And uh, any besides, you know, your software development and, and, and coding, any other yeah. artistic hobbies that you keep up with? I wish I always, like, you know, I feel like I can appreciate good, uh, good design, but I'm a terrible designer. I wish I, I could, you know, design logos and do a better job of designing like websites and apps and that stuff. But that's just not really how my brain works. Yeah, it's it's tough. Even like with the YouTube channel, I'm just like on Canva looking at these templates. I'm like, all right, that looks cool. We'll go with that. We'll roll with that. Now another question: What is one thing you would say you're oddly good at? Connect four, and that's kind of Connect random, but four. Okay, okay. I I grew up playing with my dad. That was that was basically like our game. We would play Connect Four like I don't know five to ten times a week for a good over a good few years. And uh, I stopped playing for uh, probably all throughout high school, college. And then just last year, there was, uh, we went out to eat at this place and they had a, like a public connect for kind of thing. And, and uh, just, we started playing <laughs> and I still had it. You know? everyone. And people were like, <laughs> I, I just, I, I don't understand how you're, how you're like doing that. And I'm like, I don't know. I, I just, I just play. <laughs> you're a pro connect for, that's awesome. <laughs> What is uh, one task you'd say you wish you were better at? Probably my my time management. I think sometimes I get a little too distracted. Um, I have what I think is undiagnosed ADHD. So sometimes I just really struggle to get into the zone. So uh, yeah. that's something that I'm working on. I wish I was a little bit better at that. Yeah, definitely. And then with the advent of social media and our phones, it's like, it just kind of feeds off of that, you know? <laughs> it's, yeah, everything is fighting for your attention these days. Now, what was your top artist on Spotify or iTunes for 2022? I'm actually an Apple Music user, so I didn't get that okay. that breakdown. But if I had I know to they guess... Had their equivalent, no? I feel like they had like a... Maybe they did. Sort of graph thing, yeah. Maybe they did. I, I didn't look up, but if I had to guess, it's either Bad Bunny or Fate. I'm a, oh, okay. those two are also like they're always on my on my playlist um, so what is the best way that you relax after a long day of work lately i've, I've gotten into a little into gaming that's what the, okay, you know, cool. the, like playing cod or fifa uh okay. it's good because i get to connect with my friends and, and you know we just jump on there and just talk oh, and my. catch up and laugh so I, i'd say that so now going back to some kind of more uh deeper questions if you could change one thing about the profession the pa profession what would it be Oof. I think it kind of applies to not only PAs, but providers. I mean, it's just uh, there. I think the healthcare system in general needs, needs to really be looked at again. And um, I'll, I'll give you an example, something that I, you know, having a, a tech background, I kind of see the perks and the benefits that are offered to, to the tech world. And then sometimes I feel like the irony of healthcare is that, you know, we go into into healthcare to improve the lives of others, and at the end, sometimes we wonder: Has it really, in, in fact, affected our own health? Uh, just because you know the burnout and the stress can be so large. So, I, I'd say re re-examining what inefficiencies there exist in healthcare, so that we can we get back to providers focusing on that patient encounter uh, and less on the other kind of you know admin stuff. Definitely. Yeah. Cause I've also like kind of have noticed that too. It's not so much what we're actually, you know, doing for our patients that they care about, but 
what it looks like we're doing and documenting right on 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 charts and, exactly uh, sometimes you know because of trying to get all of, of all of those metrics and data um, um for you know the informatics side of things like exactly yeah. we, the, you can kind of pigeon use or our healthcare system kind of has pigeon hold themselves into valuing that over you know what's actually or not being connected with what's actually happening on the ground you know in the precisely with a yeah I, and i think technology can can help you know at least shorten some of this uh gap that there is because I don't know if you've heard of chat GPT. It's the new wave yes. right now of artificial intelligence, right? So um, I've always imagined that there could be some kind of AI that's quote unquote listening, you know, to when you're in, in, in the room so that it's already formulating everything in that note. So you can just go back and review it yourself and be like, you know, just edit the small things that you don't agree with or whatever. But um, of course, it's no easy feature either because there's a lot of HIPAA and other things that go into it. But but I think there's yeah, definitely I mean, room for technology. Yeah, definitely room, but also with caution. I know I had read articles about like the Roomba taking pictures of people. And yeah, that ended up on the web. Like so, like it's yeah. it's, it's 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 dicey with AI. But I think if if we're cautious with it, we take the the precautions. It, it can be an asset, right. Right? right? right, Yeah. And so wrapping up, we just have three more uh, questions left. If you were to go back in time, would you change any of your experiences that got you where you are right now? Honestly, no. You know, I, I, there was a point early on in my like PA career where I, I kind of wished that I would have made the transition or, or yeah, I guess transition into, into the medical field sooner. Uh, Cause I didn't start PA school until I was 25, 26. So mm -hmm. I felt, you know, a little bit behind the curve but uh at this at this age i feel like everything that i did kind of led me the way to, to where i'm at if i would have done it earlier i wouldn't have these tech skills that i have now and uh you know everything happens for a reason is kind of the way that i view it yeah i started PA school at the age of, of 25 and kind of felt that too but looking back at it it's like you develop more of that uh just like maturity like you you have more mm -hmm. lived experience and that is an asset it went, 100%. Went caring for patients because yeah coming straight i can't imagine you know mario coming out of uh, in 2018 who was you know 22 21 years old coming out of college like going straight into pa school and, right. and you know caring for people in the way that i am now second to last question were there any times you doubted yourself on your pre-pa or pa school journey yeah no definitely i there was uh one of the chemistry classes that i took early on i did not do so hot and I kind of stopped and was like, I don't know if, if, you know, this path is right for me. Can, if I can barely handle this chemistry class, I can I actually handle, you know, being in PA school with all the other courses uh, on top of it. So I, I think it was a good point to kind of reflect. And I've always been, uh, I've had the mindset of like struggles teach you something. And if you don't learn from it, then you're, you'll repeat it. So uh, I think that kind of taught me some resilience. And then after that, uh, it had really, you know, shaped me to get through, through the rest of the journey. Yeah. And for our viewers that are like in undergrad and are going through the thick <laughs> of OCHEM and BioCHEM and all these chemistry <laughs> classes, like those classes are difficult. Like I, I, yeah. I don't care what anyone says, like it's yeah. difficult to grasp. It's an abstract concept, like at least with anatomy and pathophysiology and, you know, like the human body, you can kind of follow, you know, the pathway, but with chemistry, it's like you're learning it from the ground up. Like there's no, you know, previous knowledge. Um, all right. So the final question, this is my favorite question. What would you say to the aspiring physician associate? Never, definitely never stop. There's going to, there's going to be, the path is not uh, easy. There are no shorts uh, of failure, struggles, late nights, breakdowns, but all of that, you know, is building you up to, to be the provider that you're going to be one day. And so long as you are in it, you know, because you truly care about helping people out, uh, you are, you are meant to be on this path. This, this, uh, profession needs you and, uh, don't give up. Awesome. Alrighty. And again, just a reminder for everyone uh, watching, and please, please do yourself a favor and go check out prepabuddy.com. Please go follow the prepa buddy Instagram, and that's just at prepa buddy. And then you can also follow Carlos's actual Instagram at thefit.pa as well. 
And, and as always, if you find this content helpful, please hit that like button below, consider subscribing. And if you have any questions at all, you can feel free to leave a comment below. Animo Puebles and thank you for watching.